John chapter 10. Let's read responsively. I'll read verse 11. You read 12. We'll read it together. Down to verse 21. Notice John 10 and verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep together. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own or the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and, know my sheep. and am known of mine. Amen. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Amen. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Amen. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Amen. This commandment have I received of my Father. There was a division, therefore, again among, among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He hath a devil, and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. Amen. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Amen. We'll stop there. Let's pray together. Father, I ask your blessing upon the message. Lord, I recognize my great need of thee. Lord, please enable me to preach thy word. I ask for a fresh filling of thy spirit. And may your word this morning have free course in our hearts. I do pray if there's someone here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their good shepherd, that today would be the day they get saved and realize that he is indeed the Savior of the world, but also their Savior. And so please bless the message again. We ask you to remove any distractions from our minds and from this room for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The passage that we are looking at this morning is the final portion of Christ's discourse with the Pharisees that he gave while he was still in the city of Jerusalem after he had observed the Feast of Tabernacles. Now this discourse, these things that Jesus Christ is saying, was prompted by something that the Lord Jesus Christ did way back in the beginning of chapter 9 in verse 1. Something he did that created, may I say, quite a stir. Amen. You say, what did he do? Well, as the Lord Jesus was escaping the death threats of the Pharisees at the end of chapter 8, as he was passing through the midst of them, he stopped afterwards for a moment with his disciples, saw a man that was blind from his birth, and he healed him. Amen. Did you get that? Amen. He healed a man that was blind from his birth. Now, this man was a Jewish man. His family was, they were members of the synagogue in Jerusalem. And when that man had declared after the Pharisees had called him in and began to question him, what happened and who did this to you? Uh, and he declared that Jesus Christ was the one that healed him and that he indeed believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world. Uh, what did the Pharisees do? Well, we read in verse 34 of chapter 9 that they cast him out. They excommunicated him from the synagogue. And so when chapter 10 begins, we find the Lord Jesus Christ kind of, if you will, responding to this event by contrasting who he is, why he came, and what he provides for mankind with the Pharisees and what they are and what they can never provide for mankind. And we find him using, once again, in verse 11 and verse 14, a metaphor to describe himself. I used this earlier, a couple weeks ago in a message, and I'm going to use it again because Christ uses it again. Notice he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The Lord. Notice, if you will, in verse 14, I 
am the good shepherd. This morning I want to preach on this subject. Here's my title if you like them. The good shepherd has come. The good shepherd has arrived. You know, there are many types and metaphors that the Bible uses to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. One of our well-known Baptist forefathers, the preacher Benjamin Keach from England, his son was Elias Keach, who pastored the church in Pennypeck. That's another story. But any rate, at any rate, he wrote a book in the 1600s entitled Preaching from the Types and Metaphors of the Bible. And in this book, he lists for us, I have this book in my library at home, he lists for us the metaphors that the Bible uses to describe the Lord Jesus Christ and God and others as well. The book is over 1,000 pages long. Would you like to read it? It's about this thick. My point is this. There are many, many metaphors that are used in the Bible to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5, he is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. I like that. When Jesus Christ comes again, he's not coming as a babe in the manger, amen. He's coming to judge this world as the lion of the tribe of Judah. I like that. Amen. Maybe I'll preach on that. No, I need to move on. <laughs> then in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, Christ is described as a rock. He called himself that in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 16. But in 1 Corinthians, uh, we read, and that rock was Christ. Jesus Christ is our rock. Amen. Amen. Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 1, Christ is described as the rose of Sharon. Even throughout the book of John, we read and will read several metaphors used to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. Seven of them in the Gospel of John total. John 6.35, he said, I am the bread of life. Amen. John chapter 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. John chapter 10 and verse 9, a few verses before the ones we read this morning, we read, I am the door. John chapter 15 and verse 1, I am the true vine. All of them have meaning. And now we read Jesus Christ saying, I am the good shepherd. The Can we note this morning that he's not just a shepherd? Amen. He is the good the Lord. shepherd. Amen. Why does he use this phrase? Why does he say, I am the good shepherd to describe himself? Well, hopefully we'll see that this morning. Do you know that a shepherd is vital to the existence of sheep? Amen. You may or may not realize that, but sheep cannot survive without a shepherd. Amen. May I make a connection, kind of connect the dots here and remind us of this as well. In Isaiah 53 and verse 6, uh, the Bible describes humanity, all of humanity as sheep. We read, all we like sheep have gone astray. And sheep, by the way, are not very intelligent creatures. Now we think we are. But the truth of the matter is, is we need a shepherd. Whether you realize it or not, you may say, wait a minute, preacher, I don't like to come to church and you to say something like that of me. I didn't say it, the Bible did. Amen. We're sheep. You say, I have a degree, I have a PhD, or I have my master's, or I have this and that, I've been through this kind of training. You're still a sheep. Amen. And you need a shepherd. You see, a shepherd takes care of the sheep finds food for them. He provides shelter for them. He protects them. He defends them from enemies. He defends them from thieves and robbers and wolves. Uh, he tends to their diseases uh, uh, that they might contract. And by the way, he leads them to green pastures. That's what a shepherd does. Well, my wife and I were in Israel. As you go outside the city and you head eastward, heading down towards the Jordan Valley, uh, you'd see it gets very, uh, uh, very rural there outside the city. But if you'd glance up on the sides of the mountains, what you'd find are these Bedouin shepherds. And it's interesting what they do, because often when we think of a shepherd or someone uh, uh, with sheep, we think of them standing behind the sheep and kind of, yeah, driving them forward and so forth. It's not like that in the Middle East. The shepherd actually walks in front of them and they follow him. He leads them to where they're supposed to go. That's what a shepherd is supposed to do. 
We also know that a shepherd does not drive his sheep. He takes special care of the little ones, the lambs, and those that are weak and feeble. He takes care of the youths that are great with their young. My point is a shepherd's care for his sheep is unmatched and necessary. Amen. If he's a good shepherd. Do you know there's only one person that can truly declare to all of mankind that he is not just a shepherd, Amen. but he is the one and only unique good shepherd. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you may be here this morning and not realize that you need a shepherd, but may I sound the alarm today by saying, you and I need the good shepherd. Amen. The good shepherd has come. Let's notice some things here as we go back to John chapter 10. By the way, we're going to be going to Ezekiel 34 in a moment if you want to find that. But let's consider several things about this good shepherd. Number one is this, the coming of the good shepherd. You know what he was doing here? He was announcing the good shepherd's here. He's saying, I am here, the one you've been looking for. And notice in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. You know, during the time of Christ's earthly ministry, the Pharisees were the shepherds of the nation of Israel. Can you imagine that? But may I say this, they were not good ones. Not at all. Amen. In Old Testament times, it were the priests and the scribes uh, uh, that had been entrusted by God to be the leaders, the spiritual leaders, if you will, of his people, the nation of Israel. It was the priests and the scribes in the Old Testament, just think of Ezra as being a good example, uh, that were to take care of God's people, to spiritually feed them, to teach them the ways of God, to remind them of and point them to the coming Messiah. Amen. They were used to be the shepherds of the people. But something happened between the days of Ezra and the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Jewish religion had degenerated into an oppressive, into a self-serving, works-based religion whose uh, shepherds sought to promote their own agenda and to control the people. This was demonstrated by what they did just a few moments earlier with this man that was healed from, his, uh, from being blind from his birth. Uh, what did they do with him? They cast him out. They said, away from us, we want nothing to do with you, you're out of here. It's also, their behavior is also described by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 23. Would you turn there please with me, Matthew 23. You see, what you say, what were these uh, shepherds like? Well, we find uh, uh, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 13 of Matthew 23. Notice, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Amen. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. My point is this, we're seeing what the Lord Jesus Christ said about these shepherds, what they had degenerated to. And what people needed more than anything else, not only in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, but in our day uh, today, uh, is, for, is someone uh, who would truly provide what mankind needs. There's only one that can do that. Amen. And that is the Good Shepherd, the Lord. the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, two things about this arrival, uh, the coming of the Good Shepherd. First of all, number one is this. He was predicted in the Old Testament. Amen. You know, it's almost as if Ezekiel paints a picture of what, would, what was going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ came. Uh, go back to Ezekiel chapter 34. Now this prophecy of Ezekiel, no doubt, has a dual fulfillment. At the first coming of Christ and primarily at the second coming of Christ. But let's apply it to the first coming of Christ the, uh, here in John. But notice uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 1. 
The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God uh, unto the shepherds. Watch this. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The disease have ye not strengthened? Neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Notice, neither have ye sought that which was lost. Amen. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. Amen. And they were scattered because they ha there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains. Upon every high hill, yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Ezekiel is here describing for us in quite detail here the degeneration of Israel's leadership, their spiritual leadership. Amen. What an accurate description this is of what the scribes and Pharisees were. Even in our text, the Lord Jesus Christ describes those Pharisees and scribes as hirelings. You say, what's a hireling? It's someone who is in it only for their own benefit. And may I just comment as a side note, we see a lot of that today. Amen. People that are in uh, the ministry, if you will, for their own benefit, instead of feeding God's people, feeding the sheep, the word of God. Amen. God help us. But still in Ezekiel chapter 34, and here's the interesting part, God goes on to tell us of the true shepherd that would come. Look at verse 11, Ezekiel 34. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. And as a shepherd out of his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pastures, he says. Notice God is saying here, yes, the shepherds are going to degenerate, but don't worry, I myself am going to come. I'm going to come to earth and I'm going to deliver my sheep. I'm going to feed them with spiritual food. I am going to seek out the lost. Uh, Jesus Christ would be everything the good shepherd would be and more. Because God himself is a good shepherd. And the arrival of the good shepherd came in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. But then secondly, notice also, or predicted, it was proclaimed by Jesus Christ. Amen. They knew exactly what he was saying when he made that proclamation. He made no bones about it. He boldly told them who he was. He said to them, I am, and may I put it in my words, that good shepherd. I am the one that was spoken up by the prophet Ezekiel. I am the one that David mentioned in Psalm 23 and verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I am the one that Jacob referred to as the shepherd, the stone of Israel in Genesis 49 and verse 24. I am the one that Isaiah spoke of in Isaiah 40 verse 10, 11, when he said the Lord God will come. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. You see, Jesus Christ was proclaiming here to be the Messiah, to be God, to be the Savior of the world. The, the only one that could meet the needs of mankind. And I wonder if we believe that today. Amen. Do we believe that? Amen. That he is the only one we need. Amen. Who do you get your advice from, by the way? You say Google. <laughs> you say YouTube. They have everything on YouTube. YouTube's not the good shepherd. Amen. Google's not the good shepherd. Right. Jesus Christ is who you and I need. It's interesting he called himself the good shepherd. That has to do with the fact the word means this, worthy. It means meat. In other words, everything that you and I see in this world, everything that claims to be a shepherd, everything that claims to, to want to lead us and give us advice in our life and solve our problems, understand, falls far short of Jesus Christ. Uh, they, were mere, they are mere humans and unable to provide man's greatest needs. Right. Amen. Only Jesus Christ can. 
He is the good shepherd. He is the spiritual shepherd. He is the divine shepherd that could provide what no one else could. Amen. He's saying here, the good shepherd's come. I'm the good shepherd. So we see, first of all, number one, the coming of the good shepherd. Number two, we see the care of the good shepherd. You know, the Lord goes on after he pronounces to be the good shepherd. Now he's going to contrast himself with the Pharisees. In other words, he's going to show what he can provide and what they cannot provide. What his attitude is and what their attitude is not, should I say. He, he, he calls them hirelings, if you will. Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The sh good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Notice the contrast. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the fa so now I know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Amen. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. You could sum up all that Jesus Christ said as he contrasts himself with the Pharisees by this. The one characteristic that he is accentuating above them is this. He cares. He cares for you. Do you feel cared for today? You should. You say, I don't, nobody likes me. Well, maybe that's true, but God does. You say, nobody cares for me, man. I came into this church, only got a couple of hellos. People barely looked at me. Can I rem uh, remind you of this? Jesus Christ cares for you. Amen. He loves you. Notice again in verse 13, the hire hireling fleeth because he's a hireling. Notice, and careth not for the sheep. Amen. Jesus Christ truly cares. You say, well, I, I, how does he care? I, I, I don't really feel it. Well, let me show you how. Two ways he shows us in our text. Number one is this. His care is seen by the sacrifice he gave. Amen. Praise the Lord. You say, what did he do? He gave his life for you. Amen. Hello? Praise he gave his life for you. Uh, notice how many times he says it in verse 11. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Again, in verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17 and 18, therefore doth my Father love me. Why? Because I lay down my life, for the, lay down my life that I might take it again. Notice this, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to take it again. Amen. Jesus Christ did something that no other being could do. He laid down his life for the sheep. Amen. He went to the cross of Calvary. He left the glories of heaven and came to this earth. Why did he do that? Uh, to go and die for our sins. He willingly placed himself in the hands of sinful men. And he died on that cruel cross for me and you for our sins. Amen. Feel cared for? You should. And he did that so you and I, so all of mankind can have uh, our sins forgiven and have a home in heaven. Amen. And there's no greater act of love that anyone can do. Right. Amen. John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life Amen. for his friends. It's an amazing thing. You know, I think you and I would both agree that if we had a loved one that, uh, that required for whatever reason for us to give our life for, if it was my wife, certainly I would do that. I believe I would. If it was one of my children or grandchildren, I believe I'd do that as well. And you'd probably say the same thing. But let me ask you this. What about for a man like Adolf Hitler? What about for someone like Jeffrey Dahmer? What, what about for somebody like Charles Manson or some mass murderer or someone that's in some jail somewhere? If I said, hey, would you give your life for that person? I, I dare to say most, if not all of us, would say, uh-uh. No. That's not what Jesus Christ said. Amen. He gave his life. He shed his blood. He went to the cross of Calvary. Uh, not for some people, not for a few, not for the religious, not for the good. He went for every sinner, and that includes every human being on the face of the earth that ever lived. You know what is most amazing about what Jesus Christ did was not only the fact that he could do it, 
What's even more amazing is the fact that he would do it. Amen. Why would he do it for you and me? We're not worthy. No one deserves salvation. No one deserves a home in heaven. No one deserves to have their sins forgiven. Why did he do it then? Because he cares. Amen. He loves you. He loves the unlovable. You say, preacher, you calling me unlovable? I'm calling myself unlovable too. Amen. We're all unlovable. Amen. So he died because he cared. So his, his care is seen in the sacrifice he's gained, he, he's, he gave. But also, number two in our text, we see his care is seen by the scope of his care. Amen. And I kind of alluded to that just a moment ago. Notice in verse 16, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and, they, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. What is he saying here? Do you know that the Bible dis divides the entire world basically into two groups? Amen. There's a Jew, and then there's a Gentile. Amen. Now, if you're not a, of Jewish descent here, and there may be some, I'm sure there's a few here, then you're a Gentile. Amen. If you weren't of the nation of Israel, born of that lineage, you are a Gentile. I'm a Gentile as well. I, I am. Now, the Jews are the people that God raised up from the seed of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. We know that they were a special people to God, and by the way, they still are. Amen. They are a chosen people. Uh, they were given God's law. Uh, they were given the ordinances. They were set apart to, by God to reach the world with the knowledge of God and his coming son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be through the lineage of the Jews that the Lord Jesus Christ came and be born uh, through the seed of David. Right. So the Jews were and still are a special people in the eyes of God. Right. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says this, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. That's pretty commendable. Amen. That's speaking of the Jew. Think of Abraham, think of Isaac, think of, think of Jacob, think of Moses, uh, think of all those Old Testament characters, uh, and they were of the lineage of the Jews. But then there's the Gentiles. Yea, you say, who are, who are they? Well, that's, that's me. Amen. And if we trace it back, those are those in the Old Testament that did not know God. We had our own false gods. Uh, we denied the true and living God. We worshipped heathen gods. We engaged in the most wicked sins imaginable. And what Christ is saying here is this, is that the Jews are not the only sheep that the good shepherd is interested in. Amen. Yes, he came to present himself as a Messiah to the Jews, and we know that they rejected him. But he wasn't just interested in the Jews, and he's still not just interested in them today. Right. Amen. He's also interested in the Gentiles. Right. Matter of fact, just to put it broadly, he's interested in all of us. That's the scope of his care. Can you imagine that? You know no matter what you've done in your life, no matter where you've been, whether this be the first time you've come to this church or any church, or you've been here every day for the last 10 years, uh, uh, do you know that no matter where you're from, what you've done, Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Uh, he was buried and rose for, uh, again. Uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants to save your soul. No matter where you've been or what you've done, Amen. that is the scope of his care. Oh, the coming of the good shepherd, and then the care of the good shepherd, and then thirdly and lastly, I want you to notice the choice that man must make. Do you know that Christ does not force anyone Amen. to make them, make him their shepherd? I don't know if I got those pronouns right. I really tried to do it, but I got a little twisted. I think you understand what I mean. In other words, he doesn't say, hey, get in line now. I'm the shepherd here. Line up, everybody. Follow me, or I'm going to zap you with a lightning bolt. That's the way I would do it. And you're first, brother. I was going to say brother strong, but I picked on you instead. He just simply says this. I'm the good shepherd. Follow me. Amen. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. He simply invites us. He invites us to allow him 
to be our shepherd. And by the way, the first thing he does is he wants to save our souls. Amen. He came to seek and to save that which are lost. Do you know if you are not here, if you're here today and you're not saved, do you know that Christ is seeking you out today? Amen. You say, I, I think it's just you, preacher, yelling at us this morning. <laughs> no, no, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Put me aside for a moment. Christ wants you to be saved. Amen. He wants you to be able to say like David said, the Lord is my shepherd. But by the way, if you are saved today, then he wants you to act like he's your shepherd by, by following Amen. him. You know, a lot of people want him to be shepherd for their shepherd for salvation, but not for life. In other words, they'll say, yeah, I'm saved. He died for my sins. I know that. Praise God for that. Oh, you mean do what he tells me to do? Go to church, read my Bible, pray, live for him? I'm not going to do that. Well, then you may be saved, but he's not really your shepherd. Because the shepherd is followed Amen. by his sheep. And so notice it's interesting when the Lord Jesus Christ said all these things about who he was uh, and contrasted and showed his care. It's interesting what happened in verse 19. There was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. By the way, there'll be a, a division in this room today for these sayings. Amen. Some will walk out of here knowing him as their Savior shepherd and as the shepherd that leads them through life. Others will walk out of here saying, well, he's my savior, but I'm not going to let him be my shepherd for life. And then there's a third that may be here lost and say, he's not going to be my shepherd for my soul, and he's not going to be my shepherd for my life. God help you if that's the case. Amen. Because he's a good shepherd. Amen. He's not a bad shepherd. So there's a division. Again, notice what happens here. Uh, and many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Some may say that today. He's just saying crazy stuff. Be saved. Born again. That's loony stuff. You ever hear somebody say that? I, maybe not those words. I have been at, pl at places talking about things, preaching about things uh, uh, many times at funeral services or things like that, talking about uh, maybe at the graveside doing uh, 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 what's going to happen and if you're talking about the rapture, you know, that the next event on God's calendar is going to be Jesus Christ is coming again, the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. And I see people sitting there going, the dead in Christ shall rise and we're going to be caught up together. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, well, whoop. Amen. In a moment, a twinkle of the eye. Praise the Lord. I've seen faces like this. Some people say that. You may be here this morning and say, I don't, I don't, I don't think I need to be saved. That's crazy. It's not crazy. Amen. You're going to die one day. Right. And the creator God that made you wants you to be in heaven today. And he provided everything necessary to be in heaven through Jesus Christ. All you have to do is simply humble your proud heart. Amen. Can I say that again? Amen. Humble your proud heart. Amen. And realize you need to be forgiven and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. So there were some that thought he was crazy. He had a devil. He was, he was mad. And then notice the next group. I think these are the Nicodemuses. I think in that group of Pharisees, uh, perhaps Joseph of Arimathea was there. I, I don't know. But notice others said, these are not the words of him that had the devil. Amen. Can the devil open the eyes of the blind? So some that heard his claims chose to accept what he said. And then others to reject it. Some defamed him, some defended him. Do you know that every person in this room is going to make a decision today? Amen. You say, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. Amen. You're either going to accept what's been taught and preached from the Bible today, or you're going to reject it. Right. You say, what if I just don't do anything about it, and I don't do either? Then you've rejected it. Amen. So you don't like to think of that way. You say, well, I'm just not going to do that. Well, then you've rejected it. Right. And my, may I encourage you today... But from the love of God to your heart, Amen. that we have a God in heaven that loves you, that died for your sins, that wants to lead you and I through this maze of life with all these voices around us crying, do this and do this and do this and do this. That with outstretched arms, he calls out to the mass of humanity and basically says this, I, I am the good shepherd. Amen. 
Amen. Would you follow him today? Amen. Would you trust him as Savior? Would you allow him to lead you through, navigate you through this maze of life? You will never regret it if you Amen. do. Amen. Praise Let's pray together.